Men and women, lives on the line. These are the real stories of the Highway Patrol. And on the morning of July 3rd, 1970, a man drives the Indiana Interstate in a stolen car. In an isolated area, he spots what appears to be another car abandoned alongside the road. There is no one else in sight. He stops to check it out and finds the car deserted. Quickly, he breaks in on the passenger side away from the road. Finding nothing of value inside, he begins to remove the license plate from the front of the car. Indiana trooper Jerry Wilder, just beginning his morning shift, is patrolling the same interstate. As he heads north on I-65, there is almost no traffic, and so far no problems on this warm July day. Tossing the first license plate into his stolen car, the thief spots Wilder's patrol car heading toward him down the interstate. Thinking quickly, he yanks open the hood of the abandoned car and takes cover. About five minutes after I had gone to work and observed where an abandoned vehicle had been sitting for the past two or three days, another vehicle was sitting beside it. I pulled up behind the two vehicles, observed a subject in front of the abandoned vehicle with the hood up. My first thought was that the subject was stealing gas from the abandoned vehicle. At no time did I think that I was going to be in danger. I just thought that either the subject was either having car trouble or was stealing gas. Nonetheless, as a precaution, Officer Wilder keeps his right hand ready on his holster as he approaches the man. He also notices the license plate in his car. Good morning. How you doing? Problem here? No, I ain't got a problem. The subject was very calm when I first approached him, very uh, matter of fact as far as what he was doing. What happened to the license plate on the front of this car? I took it off. Why would you do that? Because I need to, the screws to fix my other plate. Why? Just stand up against the car there. What's, what's the problem? Just stay there. Don't move. What's the problem? Just stay there. The patrolman becomes suspicious about the man's explanations, and especially the obviously stolen license plate. Telling the suspect not to move, he investigates the car. You broke in this car, didn't you? No, I didn't break in this car. It's my car. I want to take a look in your car. What do you want to look in my car for? I want to look in your car. For what? Move to the car. Why are you harassing me? As Wilder presses the suspect, the encounter escalates. But when the trooper demands to look into his car, the man seems cooperative. As the suspect goes around to the driver's door, Trooper Wilder proceeds to the passenger side of the car. He points to the locked door and demands that it be opened. I took one step back and pointed and told him to unlock the door. And at this time, when I was pointing at the suspect, I was looking down the barrel of a gun. Face to face with a 9mm Luger pistol, Wilder reacts instinctively. The suspect falls out of sight. But because the officer shot through a car window, he doesn't know if the man is hit or just hiding. Cautiously, he makes his way around the car. Wilder finds the man wounded, crawling along the ground, still clutching his gun. And he started crawling uh, toward the edge of the road, and that's where then he stopped crawling and apparently died. Giving him a wide berth, the trooper gets to his patrol car radio and calls for assistance. At this time, I ran a check on the license plate and found that the uh, vehicle had been stolen. Actually, I had no feelings other than that I had uh, done something that I had never done before. I knew that the uh, subject had pulled a gun on me, uh, and I really felt that uh, it was either me or him that was going to end up, uh, he'd probably end up dead. The gunman, Kenneth Wayne Smith, died within moments. An ex-con, he had been involved in a shootout in nearby Hammond and was fleeing in a stolen car with an unregistered gun. He apparently stopped to get the abandoned car's license plates to disguise his own. In the 23 years since this event, Indiana trooper Jerry Wilder has never again had to kill anyone. But if another situation occurs, he'll be prepared. 
when one comes or becomes a police officer, I don't think that you really feel that you're ever going to be put into a situation that you're going to have to take another person's life. If it happens again, uh, it's, if it's either going to be me or somebody else, uh, the way I look at it, it's, it, I'm going to be the survivor. PM. Police are called to a family fight in a Rockport apartment complex. As she approaches the building, the officer can see and hear an angry, drunken argument between a father and son. Leaving her car unattended, she hurries to the scene. The policewoman intervenes, separating the men and questioning the father, who angrily tells her his side of the story. He's pushing on me. From the porch, the drunken man notices the Rockford police car. Lights on, engine running, and no one inside. Without hesitation or forethought, he makes for the car. As the officer continues her investigation of the disturbance, the drunken son climbs into the squad car and drives off. The officer doesn't realize the man is gone until she sees her car pulling away. She immediately notifies Jasper headquarters, which broadcasts an all-points area alert for the stolen police car, last seen heading north on US-231. One of the officers who hears the call is Indiana State Trooper Danny Price on night patrol not far from the scene. Rockport and County Unit are in a stolen police car northbound on 231 from Rockport. Sir, Jasper, Price immediately heads out of town. I started that way, a red license siren, in order to uh, attempt to, uh, to intercept the vehicle and to uh, help with the pursuit. The night was a cloudy, misting, rainy night. Uh, not a lot of heavy rain, but just a night where the roads were slick and wet and the potential for accidents were there. The first to catch up with the intoxicated driver is Spencer County Deputy Sheriff Ed Masterson. But instead of yielding to the officer, the driver pulls away at high speed. The chase is on. Within a few miles of town, Trooper Price sees the stolen car up ahead, traveling without roof lights and with the deputy sheriff close behind. Price joins in the pursuit, keeping some distance behind. They turned down a county road, a narrow county road, after some miles, and uh, I began to catch up with him. About half a mile behind him. I could see him about a mile or so ahead, and I called him on our emergency law enforcement network to advise him that I was behind him and was closing on him uh, quickly. I eventually passed the city police car and then was behind the sheriff's department car and the suspect vehicle. Now, I could hear their radio traffic talking uh, between the sheriff's deputy and the city police car, talking that the suspect was driving uh, erratically, uh, was obviously intoxicated, was driving at speeds from 40 to 80 mile an hour and back and forth. The fact that he was in a police car posed a specific danger for us. Not only was there a possibility that there were weapons in it, but he had a radio and he was listening and everything we were talking about. The two officers stay on the radio as they follow the stolen police car onto the narrow winding county roads, roads with which Trooper Price is familiar. I'm coming up behind you. I can see you. What's the point? Yeah, I've got him right in front of me. He's, he's swerved across the center line a couple times, uh, possibly 1055. Will you take him? Whenever you're ready. You get in the front, I'll get on the side. We'll get to 66 in the rear back and forth and decided that at some point we were going to try to box the vehicle in because he was going at such a speed around 40 to 50 to 60 mile an hour that we thought we could do that. We also knew being familiar with the, the roads in the area that there was a sharp curve approaching. It was misting rain and there was a good chance he was going to wreck. Okay, while we wait, there's no traffic in here. Let's just wait and see what he did on this curve that's coming up. 10-4. He's, he's pretty impaired. So we felt comfortable in letting him drive until he made a mistake. As the 90-degree turn approaches, the troopers brace themselves, almost certain that the drunk driver will lose control of the squad car on the rain-slick road. He did just that. He came into a 90-degree turn, lost control, went through a fence, out into a field, back onto the road, in the 180 degrees from where he started. As the sheriff's deputy blocks the suspect from the front, Trooper Price moves to block him from the rear, while Trooper Cutler pulls alongside. However, before Trooper Cutler could get there, the suspect threw the car in reverse, drove partially in the ditch and around my car. On the rain slick roads then, I bumped him, forced him into the ditch. He somehow got out again. I bumped him again and he went into the ditch again. The sheriff's deputy, having been facing the correct direction, passed me and attempted to force him again into the ditch, which he did. 
the suspect across the ditch and into a field. He's still in pursuit, Jasper. We've got one vehicle off the road. I'm, I'm going to continue the pursuit. With the other police units left behind, only Price's patrol car is still in the chase. He stays on the county road, running parallel to the stolen car that is racing at high speed through the field. His plan is to reach the next driveway first, turn in, then block the stolen car before he can get back onto the highway. At this point, I'm thinking there's no way he can get back on the road. He's got a deep ditch, he's got a muddy field, and I'm going to block off his only retreat. But to Price's amazement, the drunken driver guns his car out of the field, back through the ditch and onto to the road behind the patrol car, passing the trooper and speeding away. Jasper, we got one vehicle off the road. I'm, I'm going to continue the pursuit. Next, watch the exciting conclusion to the chase as troopers close in on the drunken car thief. Jasper headed uh, back east towards 231. The gap closes slowly as Indiana State Trooper Danny Price continues to tail the stolen squad car. The thief still trying to elude capture. Continuing the pursuit, however, I have had a 1050. But it's the vivid image of the thief's earlier daredevil escape from the trooper's blockade that spurs the determined Price not to lose sight of the car along the dark back roads. Approaching Rio in a couple of miles. Still outside the vehicle, however, he is quite a ways in front of me. Still outside of it. The pursuit continues for miles until finally the officer completely loses sight of the driver in the dark maze of back county roads. However, about half an hour later, headquarters receives word from a citizen of an abandoned police car. The officers quickly head to the nearby town of Grandview. Suddenly, they see the drunk just walking nonchalantly along the edge of the road. The officers react quickly. Trooper Price thinks to turn on his docu-camera as he leaps from the car. Officer Jack Cutler arrives at the same time time. The troopers simultaneously tackle and arrest the man. He was in such a drunk stupor at that point that he offered little resistance. In fact, he didn't even act like he knew we were in the area. Uh, he was arrested and incarcerated in the jail. Because of the man's long history of traffic violations, he is already considered a habitual traffic violator. Now he is charged with vehicle theft, resisting law enforcement, criminal recklessness with a vehicle, operating while intoxicated, and operating while suspended as a habitual traffic violator. In addition to serving his sentence, the suspect is required to pay $7,000 worth of damages to police and sheriff's department cars. What made this situation so unique was that just two days prior to this, I had had a docu-cam installed into my car. Uh, and when the call came in and a pursuit was on, I thought immediately that, well, here's the opportunity to use our new equipment. So I knew that it would come in handy, and it did. It's just after sunrise on the morning of September 1st, 1978. Two men run through the woods of Putnamville, Indiana. Leslie Smith and Andrew Pine have just escaped from a state prison. Both are convicted felons with a long history of criminal activity. The men make their way to the side of the highway where a car is waiting. Dispatches on the two suspects are filling the airwaves. Within minutes, Indiana State Trooper Richard Rice observes the suspect vehicle and starts his pursuit. Guys, get down. There's a cut back there. continues his pursuit. Sergeant Lanny Fields is patrolling nearby and hears his colleague's dispatch. Fields heads towards Rice's location as backup. Meanwhile, Rice pulls the suspect vehicle over. Driver! Passenger! Show your hand! Man, I don't believe it. Passenger in the rear! Exit the vehicle to the rear! Yeah, right. Yeah. Driver, exit Be cool, the vehicle! Cool. Go now! Driver, exit the vehicle. Turn around. Face the other direction. Do it now. As the suspects step out of their car, Trooper Fields arrives on the scene. 
The two officers cautiously approach the escapees and begin to handcuff them. Rice cuffs Pine and Fields attempts to cuff Smith. But Smith's wrists are extremely large and Fields is barely able to get the handcuff to the first notch on Smith's right hand. When Smith complains the handcuff is cutting his wrist, Fields takes him to his car to get his keys to adjust the handcuffs. The officer holds his suspect down with one arm and reaches for his keys with the other. As he adjusts Smith's handcuffs, the escapee makes his move. Come on. Break. Drop the gun, Peg. Drop it. Drew, get his gun. Rock game now ain't playing. Smith threatens to blow Fields' head off if Rice won't give up his gun. Seeing that the convict I'm is dealing. desperate, I'm Smith hands over his weapon clean. and removes Pine's handcuffs. Now both men are armed. Smith orders the two patrolmen into the trunk of Rice's car. He tries to close the trunk but cannot, succeeding only in slamming the metal onto the officer's heads. Smith's anger and desperation are clear. He is capable of anything, and the two patrolmen fear they're about to be killed. But at that moment, Trooper Charles Raritan pulls onto the scene. Guys, put the gun down! Drop the gun! Smith orders Raritan to give his gun to Pine. But unknown to Smith or Pine, Raritan has an off-duty 38 caliber revolver in the small of his back. And when the time comes, he makes his move. With Pine secured, it's now Raritan versus Smith. The officer screams at Smith to surrender. But the escapee screams back that if Raritan doesn't drop his gun, he'll kill Patrolman Rice and Fields. Raritan refuses to back down. And Smith, reaching a breaking point, reacts. He opens the trunk and points the 357 revolver at Fields' head. But in the split second before he fires, Fields manages to raise his arm between himself and the gun. This instinctive movement saves the officer's life, because when Smith fires, the bullet hits Fields in the arm instead of the head. Raritan reacts by shooting Smith in the back. The lives of the two highway patrolmen are saved due to the resourcefulness of a fellow officer. Leslie Smith recovered from his wound and was convicted of escape, attempted kidnapping, and attempted murder. He is now serving a 70-year sentence in the Indiana State Penitentiary. Andrew Pine was convicted of escape and attempted kidnapping and is now serving a 42-year sentence in the Indiana State Penitentiary. At 3 a.m. on a warm day in July, a 7-Eleven convenience store is robbed. Don't you move! Give me all your money! Come on! All of it! All of it! While his female accomplice keeps the getaway car idly, the robber brandished his blue steel revolver, demanding that the terrified clerk give him all of her cash. We're playing games! Come on! Don't you move! I'll blow you away! You move one inch! You just stand right there! Stand right there! Come on! He threatens to kill one of the customers as he runs out of the store with the money. Then makes his getaway with his girlfriend at the go, wheel. Come on, go, 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 go! The store clerk sees enough of the car to give a good description of it to police, who immediately broadcast the information to all on-duty units. Officer Michael D. Crescenzo of the Sheriffville Police Department first spots the getaway car on US 41. He quickly makes a U-turn to follow it. The thief notices the pursuing officer as well. Realizing police are closing in, the robber improvises, ordering his girlfriend to pull over. Got an idea. Yeah, pull over right up here. As the car stops, the suspect makes a desperate move, immediately shooting at the pursuing officer. In the brief gun battle that follows, the officer hits the fleeing man in the leg, but still the gunman manages to escape. A foot search of the area gives no clue to his whereabouts. Get off! Drop the car now! Don't move! Spread your legs back! Keep your hands where they are! Keep your right hand! Get back here! Don't move! Keep your left hand! I want you to stay there! Don't move! However, after arresting the woman accomplice, the officer finds an address book in the suspect's car. Inside, the police find the address of a residence in nearby Cedar Lake. The girlfriend confirms it's her boyfriend's home. Local Cedar Lake policeman Bruce Grah is dispatched to the suspect's house along with Indiana State Trooper Frank Aldridge. 1023, the suspect's residence. The city's with me also. The officers reach the residence at the same time, hoping to get some information about the suspect's whereabouts from his parents. 
They approach the house carefully, unaware that the suspect is inside. I'll check the front. Okay. Suddenly, they discover the gunman is at home, but not expecting the police. The suspect reacts quickly. He's going out the back. I'll head back that way. He leaves the house through the rear and heads across the backyard with Officer Gra close behind. Then the suspect vaults a fence and heads down the street. While the policeman pursues the man on foot, Trooper Aldrich goes around the block in his patrol car, hoping to cut him off. Spotting the suspect, he blocks the road with his car, just as the suspect tries to cross the street. Please, drop the gun! Cornered, the armed suspect fires at the officer on foot. Aldrich immediately returns fire, and in the quick exchange that follows, the suspect is hit in the abdomen and goes down. The city police officer keeps the wounded gunman covered as State Trooper Aldrich calls for medical aid. Law 52550. Rush traffic. Shots fired. Suspect down. Request a 1052 my location. Supervisor. The suspect received CPR at the scene and recovered from the gunshot wounds. He was found guilty of armed robbery and is currently serving a 20-year sentence in the Michigan City Prison. in the morning, Indiana State Trooper Michael Neufer pulls into the parking lot of a government maintenance building to get gas. He notices a parked car facing out towards the road in an area not accessible to the general public. As he approaches the car, he sees some movement. Neufer turns his car sharply into a T formation with the parked vehicle. Suddenly, a man darts out of his vehicle and tries to hide, crouching down behind the car. Hey, buddy, I see you sitting over there. Stand up, come over here now. The alleged driver does not respond. Stand up, come over here. After repeated commands, the man eventually walks slowly towards the trooper. I just need some help. Hey, stop right there. Let me As see he nears, you. it appears he's asking for some sort of help. But Trooper Neufer notices a gun on his waistband and draws his service revolver, aiming it at the man, ordering him to stop. Stop right there now! Reluctantly, the man stops, and Neufer orders him down on his knees. Get down on your knees! Oh, come on, man, I need some help! Get down on your knees now! Keep your arms out to your side! Neufer, believing he has the situation under control, removes one hand from the gun and reaches into his car to radio for help. Meanwhile, the suspect, lying on his stomach, continues to watch Neufer's moves and begins to slowly slide his arm down towards his gun. The trooper is momentarily distracted, turning his head to see a maintenance worker leaving the building. The suspect gets to his knees and fires at the trooper, who now wastes no time in ducking behind his car. Put your gun down right now! Give it up! I don't want to hurt you! The suspect fires a second shot in Neufer's direction while advancing towards him. Not known to Neufer, the 41-year-old suspect who fails to identify himself is a foreman at a local steel plant with no prior arrest record. Put your gun down now! The trooper now positions himself behind his car as the suspect manages to shift the car into reverse. I got you now. As the car starts to roll back, Neufer knows he needs to run for cover before he is either shot or crushed. I'm gonna kill you! Looking over his shoulder, he notices a possible safety barrier behind him. Running for his life, he hurriedly moves to find cover. I'll get you, man. I'll stop you. The trooper gets to his feet and yells to the suspect to surrender. Give it up! I'm gonna shoot if you don't put it down! After several warnings and still refusing to surrender, the suspect starts running away. Neufer, left with no choice, fires five rounds, dropping the suspect to the ground. Cautiously walking over to the gunman, Neufer extends his leg and kicks the revolver out of the suspect's hand. Uh, the decision he made to use deadly force against a police officer ended in, in his own peril. I don't know what exactly his motives were. I thought then, and I think now, that he may have wanted to die that night. I just happened to come into the area 
and uh, make it easier for him. The suspect expired four hours later. He had no prior criminal or medical record of any kind. The autopsy revealed no sign of either drugs or alcohol. Indiana morning, State Trooper Dave Richard shift is nearly over. All night long, he's had a feeling that something out of the ordinary was brewing. With only a few minutes left on his shift, he was beginning to think his premonition was wrong. Feeling more relaxed, he bites off a chaw of chewing tobacco. Moments later, his premonition turns into reality. 4467. 4467. Check out his disabled vehicle northbound I-65 at mile marker 88. 4467, clearing en route. As Richards pulls up to the car, a silent alarm goes off in his mind. The trooper had received several calls earlier that evening reporting a reckless speeder in a car similar to this one. Well, then you win it, partner. What's going on? Oh, man, I just pulled over here to rest. My battery's died. Can you give me a Richard's job? suspicions are aroused by the driver's nervous behavior and desire to move on as quickly as possible. He smells liquor on the man's breath. Richard, suspecting a possible DUI, asks the man to go back with him to his squad car to answer some questions. The man reluctantly complies. What's your name, partner? Uh, it's Richard. Richard what? Um, Foreman. Richard's suspicions deepen when the man gives him a name different from the one on his driver's license. Not what your driver's license says. The man continues to act fidgety. Trooper Richards sees the car has no license plates and asks why. The man says he put them in his truck when he pulled over so no one would steal them. The officer tells him to put them back on, using the time to get information about the suspect's real identity. 4467. Driver's license check on a Richard Foreman. Richard Foreman, 12-6 of 48, 12-6 of 48. While the man puts the plates back on his car, Richards is having radio transmission problems. This delays the response, allowing the man to return to the squad car. Seven, be advised that plate is reported stolen and the subject in possession of a plate is wanted by the FBI. He also has a long list of aliases and the computer is still running. No, man, I ain't right. 4467. His suspicions confirmed. Richards orders the suspect out of the car. Even though visibly agitated, he follows the officer's commands. Richards attempts to secure the suspect, but he resists. Some stolen license plates over there up on the No way, man. Up on the car. Oh, Come on. The harder Richards tries to take charge, the more belligerent the suspect becomes. Finally, the man lets loose. Put him back here. You're under arrest. Put your hands up on your head. He is bigger than Richards and in no mood to take any more orders. The men grapple by the side of the highway, rolling, kicking, and trading blows. In the course of the fight, Richards loses his gun. The struggle continues, and the suspect, wild and desperate, still refuses to give in. Trooper Richards' strength is fueled by the knowledge that the suspect won't hesitate to injure or possibly kill him. Finally, at a point when the men are literally head-to-head, -head, Richards spits his chewing tobacco into Foreman's eyes. His adversary is momentarily blinded and surprised, allowing Richards to handcuff him. Dispatch 4467. Dispatch 4467. Hey! What are you gonna do now? Shut up! I got another set. Do that again, I'm gonna shoot you. Get back in here! But the suspect isn't finished yet. Richards catches him just in time, slamming him onto the trunk of his car just as a backup unit arrives. Finally, the fight is over. If there was a lesson to be learned here for the younger officers or any police officers, remember there's no such thing as a routine call and think at all times, officer survivability. As a result of this episode, he was charged with resisting arrest and assault and battery on a police officer. He served a two-year sentence at an Indiana State Prison facility.
Shortly after 9 o'clock, a car pulls into a west side gas station. But these customers aren't here to fill up their tank. They're here to fill up their pockets with cash. Yeah, no. okay. Open their drawer. Come on. Come on. Give me the money. Come on. Come on. Okay. Come on. Come on. Come on. The robbery takes only seconds. And moments later, the couple drives off into the night, apparently making a clean getaway. Yeah. Two or three hundred bucks, okay? That's all they had. Two or three hundred bucks? That's all they had. Would you shut up, woman? The robbers pass up? Indiana State Trooper William Smith, who has been alerted to the armed robbery suspects. The fugitive's vehicle matches the description he received. Smith begins to follow the suspects, calling dispatch to report his pursuit. Indianapolis 4462, information. I just had a vehicle go by, matches the description of the holdup vehicle. The thieves are distracted by their argument and don't notice that they are being followed. Then, Trooper Smith turns on his lights. It's the cops! The driver speeds up and swerves across the road, preventing Smith from closing in. The officer tries to outmaneuver the other driver, but can't pull up alongside or pass him. A backup unit joins the pursuit. As Smith begins to pull closer to the vehicle, the suspect tries a more desperate move. In spite of the suspect's actions, Smith does not return fire. Instead, he uses evasive action to avoid being hit. But when the driver fires at Smith's backup, the trooper takes action. Trooper Smith is not sure if his shot hit the suspect. So he approaches the car with extreme caution. Hands up where I can see him. Get out of the car. Do what I tell you. Get out. Get out. Smith sees that his bullet found its mark. The chase is over. I don't feel that I had any choice in this episode. Um, I had no intentions on using deadly force even when he was firing upon me. Something clicked in my mind when I seen him shoot point blank at the other officer, and I knew that he would have killed the other officer had the other officer not reacted when I yelled at him to back off. After he'd done that, uh, I really didn't have any feelings toward that individual. All I was concerned about was taking him out before he took out an innocent victim. George C. Lloyd died of gunshot wounds. He had had two prior armed robbery convictions. His companion, Sarah Penter, was charged with armed robbery. She was convicted and served 15 years' time. The following reenactment, taken directly from the files of the Indiana State Police, features Trooper Mark Tao in a race against a reckless driver. Indiana troopers portray the people in our true story. It's a beautiful fall day, and Indiana State Police Trooper Mark Tao has just stopped a speeding driver on a highway that he patrols regularly. Tao, who's been on the force for six years, began his career as an Army policeman. back there. I don't know if he was drunk or something, but he was all over the road. What kind of car was it? Uh, it was a blue four-door sedan. It had its brake light out, too. Which side? Uh, the left side. Okay, thank you. Yep. Moments later, the weaving driver goes right past the trooper. The trooper quickly finishes writing the ticket and takes off after the reckless driver. <laughs> trooper Tao tells dispatch that he's now in pursuit. He's been in several high-speed chases before and hoped he could avoid another one. The reckless driver finally pulls over and Trooper Tao turns on his dashboard camera. What you're seeing is actual footage of the stop. How you doing today? 
today? What are you stopping me for? How much you have to drink today? I haven't had anything to drink. Do you have a driver's license? When I pulled the driver over, I actually thought he was intoxicated. However, by the appearance of the interior of the vehicle, no odor of alcohol in his breath, I didn't know what I had at the time. Hey! Hey! Hey, what are you doing? Hey! As the pursuit continued southbound on the highway, my main concern was that he would definitely slam into somebody. He showed absolutely no regard for the traffic laws or other motorists on the highway at that time. The trooper, now joined by a local county sheriff, tries to box in the suspect. Reckless driver pulls onto the median and appears to stop. Almost immediately, he throws the car in reverse and speeds off down the highway against oncoming traffic. Trooper Tao now has to act fast to try and prevent a major tragedy. That when we come back. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Hey, Indiana hey, State Trooper hey, Mark Tao stops a reckless driver who speeds off when he tries to take the man's keys. The trooper and a local county sheriff box the man in, but then he changes direction, setting up a possible head-on collision on a busy highway. During the pursuit, my physical state was one of nervousness and tension. I cannot imagine going through that again and what the people that were southbound on the highway had to think. <laughs> can't avoid hitting the driver. Right, sir, hold up. <laughs> but even that doesn't stop the man. The right side of his car has been hit, but he's still trying to get away. The sheriff drives in front of the suspect, thinking he can head him off if he tries to pass. When the man makes a sudden left turn, Trooper Tao can't help hitting him again. Even though the driver is stunned by the collision, it takes three troopers to subdue him. What's the one cop? Give me his hand. Pull him over. Give me that other hand. When it was all over with, I felt sorry for the gentleman because of his mental state. I felt frustrated. I didn't know where to place my anger. On one hand, I felt sorry for the gentleman. On the other hand, he risked a lot of people's lives to get done what he did. The driver was not intoxicated, but was having marital problems. He was fined $100 and given six months in jail for reckless driving. His driver's license was also revoked. Trooper Tao, a member of the Indiana State Police SWAT team, is still on patrol. Adams and Charles Elkton have just hot-wired and stolen a car. In the middle of his shift, newlywed trooper Richard Hammer of the Indiana State Police stops home to surprise his wife. She's not there, but he leaves the police scanner on so she'll know he's been there to see her. Trooper Hammer is back on the road when he sees a car speed by him and run a red light. The car has a bad muffler and a burned out brake light. Damn, why'd you go through that red light? What are we gonna do now? Just shut up. I think it's something. Trooper Hammer follows the car for several miles with his siren and lights on, but the driver doesn't pull over. Okay, we're northbound, north now, we're back towards 16. The trooper's wife has returned home. The scanner that the trooper left on is blaring in the background. She interrupts her phone conversation when she hears her husband's name and something about a high-speed pursuit. He's still on a 
our butt. If you do something, we're gonna get caught. Shut up, I got a plan. We're gonna come up here, stop. You go to the right, I'm gonna go to the left. We've lost contact with 3 a.m. on a warm day in July, a 7-Eleven convenience store is robbed. Don't you move! Give me all your money! Come on! All of it! All of it! While his female accomplice keeps the getaway car idly, the robber brandished his blue steel revolver, demanding that the terrified clerk give him all of her cash. Come on! Come on! Don't you move! I'll blow you away! You move one inch! You just stand right there! Stand right there! Come on! He threatens to kill one of the customers as he runs out of the store with the money, then makes his getaway with his girlfriend at the wheel. The store clerk sees enough of the car to give a good description of it to police, who immediately broadcast the information to all on-duty units. Officer Michael D. Crescenzo of the Sherrillville Police Department first spots the getaway car on US-41. He quickly makes a U-turn to follow it. The thief notices the pursuing officer as well. Realizing police are closing in, the robber improvises, ordering his girlfriend to pull over. You got an idea? Just, yeah, pull over right up here. As the car is stopped, the suspect makes a desperate move, immediately shooting at the pursuing officer. In the brief gun battle that follows, the officer hits the fleeing man in the leg, but still the gunman manages to escape. A foot search of the area gives no clue to his whereabouts. Get your hands up! Get down and drop the car now! Don't move! Spread your legs back! Keep your hands where they are! Keep your right hand! Get back here! Don't move! Give me your left hand. I want you to stay there. Don't move. 
However, after arresting the woman accomplice, the officer finds an address book in the suspect's car. Inside, the police find the address of a residence in nearby Cedar Lake. The girlfriend confirms it's her boyfriend's home. Local Cedar Lake policeman Bruce Grah is dispatched to the suspect's house along with Indiana State Trooper Frank Aldridge. At 1023, the suspect's residence the city's with me also. The officers reach the residence at the same time, hoping to get some information about the suspect's whereabouts from his parents. They approach the house carefully, unaware that the suspect is inside. I'll check the front. Okay. Suddenly they discover the gunman is at home, but not expecting the police. The suspect reacts quickly. He's going out the back. I'll head back that way. He leaves the house through the rear and heads across the backyard with Officer Grah close behind. Then the suspect vaults a fence and heads down the street. While the policeman pursues the man on foot, Trooper Aldridge goes around the block in his patrol car, hoping to cut him off. Spotting the suspect, he blocks the road with his car, just as the suspect tries to cross the street. Please, drop the gun! Cornered, the armed suspect fires at the officer on foot. Aldrich immediately returns fire, and in the quick exchange that follows, the suspect is hit in the abdomen and goes down. The city police officer keeps the wounded gunman covered as State Trooper Aldridge calls for medical aid. Law 52550, rush traffic. Shots fired, suspect down. Request a 1052, my location, supervisor. The suspect received CPR at the scene and recovered from the gunshot wounds. He was found guilty of armed robbery and is currently serving a 20-year sentence in the Michigan City Prison. On a spring day in Indiana, State Trooper Michael Newford began his midnight shift by stopping to put gas in his patrol car. What happened next? was something he would never forget. At two o'clock in the morning, Indiana State Trooper Michael Neufer pulls into the parking lot of a government maintenance building to get gas. He notices a parked car facing out towards the road in an area not accessible to the general public. As he approaches the car, he sees some movement. Neufer turns his car sharply into a T formation with the parked vehicle. Suddenly, a man darts out of his vehicle and tries to hide, crouching down behind the car. Hey, buddy, I see you sitting over here. Let's stand up. Come over here now. The alleged driver does not respond. Stand up. Come over here. After repeated commands, the man eventually walks slowly towards the trooper. I just need some help. Hey, stop right there. Let me As he around. nears, it appears he's asking for some sort of help. But Trooper Neufer notices a gun on his waistband and draws his service revolver, aiming it at the man, ordering him to stop. Stop right there now! Reluctantly, the man stops, and Neufer orders him down on his knees. Get down on your knees! Oh, come on, man, I need some help! Get down on your knees now! Keep your arms out to your side! Neufer, believing he has the situation under control, removes one hand from the gun and reaches into his car to radio for help. Meanwhile, the suspect, lying on his stomach, continues to watch Neufer's moves and begins to slowly slide his arm down towards his gun. The trooper is momentarily distracted, turning his head to see a maintenance worker leaving the building. The suspect gets to his knees and fires at the trooper, who now wastes no time in ducking behind his car. Put your gun down right now! Give it up! I don't want to hurt you! The suspect fires a second shot in Neufer's direction while advancing towards him. Not known to Neufer, the 41-year-old suspect who fails to identify himself is a foreman at a local steel plant with no prior arrest record. Put your gun down now! The trooper now positions himself behind his car as the suspect manages to shift the car into reverse. I got you down. As the car starts to roll back, Neufer knows he needs to run for cover before he is either shot or crushed. I'm gonna kill you! Looking over his shoulder, he notices a possible safety barrier behind him. Running for his life, he hurriedly moves to find cover. I'll get you, man. I'm gonna stab you! Get 
The trooper gets to his feet and yells to the suspect to surrender. Give it up! I'm gonna shoot if you don't put it down! After several warnings and still refusing to surrender, the suspect starts running away. Nooper, left with no choice, fires five rounds, dropping the suspect to the ground. Cautiously walking over to the gunman, Nooper extends his leg and kicks the revolver out of the suspect's hand. Uh, the decision he made to use deadly force against a police officer ended in, in his own peril. I don't know what exactly his motives were. I thought then and I think now that he may have wanted to die that night. I just happened to come into the area and uh, make it easier for him. The suspect expired four hours later. He had no prior criminal or medical record of any kind. The autopsy revealed no sign of either drugs or alcohol. This real story comes from the files of the Indiana State Police. Indiana senior trooper J.T. O'Daniel tries to help three intoxicated men, only to find out that they are criminals and that gratitude is the furthest thing from their minds. J.T., are you done yet? Just about. It took a little bit longer than I thought. I'm going to be late. Today is Indiana State Police Senior Trooper J.T. O'Daniel's birthday. Tomorrow is his wife's birthday, but there's no time to celebrate as she's off to night school, and he goes on patrol in two hours. Thanks, hon. Trooper O'Daniel, who once worked for the FBI, has been on the force for 12 years. You don't drink too many drinks. <laughs> I'm ready to go to bed now. <laughs> Luke Hornsby just escaped from a Kentucky prison where he was serving time for armed robbery. Tonight he's out drinking with his cousin Henry Matson and former partner in crime Darrell Carter. Both men are out on bond on burglary charges. Come on, guys. I've got a wife I've got to get home to. <laughs> well, you're going to let me drive because you're too drunk. I gotta go with the boys. I'll see you later. No! I gotta go. Oh, come on, stick around. I gotta go with the boys. Oh. Look at the door. I'm the designated driver. Jeez, man, you almost killed him. Don't worry about it, he's under control. Trooper O'Daniel only has two more hours left on his shift. Heavily intoxicated, the driver isn't concentrating. Moments after the accident, Trooper O'Daniel stops to help. A trucker and a highway worker have also stopped to help. When the trooper helps the man out of the car, he quickly checks him for concealed weapons. Guys, I'll take care of this. I appreciate you all sticking around. I'll take care of it. You guys take off. Why don't you guys come back here and get in the car with me? Come on back here. Hold on to him. You guys get in the back here. I'll get him up front here. O'Daniel has put a box of equipment directly behind his seat so that no one will sit there. Okay, guys, identifications? Uh, I, I, uh, I'm, uh, William Matson. The escaped convict gives his cousin's name. You? Uh, I'm William. William? Do you have a last name, William? No, he doesn't even know his last name. He's a litter. Trooper O'Daniel calls in a driver's license and warrant check on the man. He also asks for a tow truck and sheriff's deputies to back him up. I, I gotta go to the bathroom. Man, I gotta go to the bathroom bad. Okay. okay, just hold on a minute. I'll come around there and get you, okay? Just wait for me. Trooper 
Sparrow Daniel thinks something is wrong and wants to handcuff the man. Man, are you all right? Here, come up here. A dangerous fugitive commandeers a trooper's car as he hangs on for his life. A dangerous fugitive commandeers a trooper's car as he hangs on for his life. A prison escapee, his cousin, and an accomplice skid off the road. When Indiana senior trooper J.T. O'Daniel stops to help, two of them get away. Stop! The trooper's life is threatened as the fugitive races down the highway, Stop! assaulting the trooper to shake him loose. Daniel tries to fire, but his gun is broken from the car door slamming against him. The two men see a chance to escape. Evansville 35, 55, getting some help on the interstate just east of Linville. I got injuries, two subjects on foot. Warwick County Sheriff's Deputy Bob Urban and his canine follow the suspect's tracks. The trooper has suffered head and leg wounds. Don't stand in the dock. Coming out. Don't stand in that dock. The remaining fugitive is tracked to a culvert. Troopers decide not to send in the canine unit because the pipes are too small and the dog could be in danger. The Leavenworth Fire Department is called in. Firefighters pump in 5,000 gallons of water, but it doesn't work and the fugitive won't come out. gas is thrown in, intensified by the moisture in the air. The convict was found guilty of escape and being a habitual offender, he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Dawson was convicted of battery on a law enforcement officer resulting in bodily injury and was given two years in prison. Carter was convicted of assisting a criminal and received four years in prison. At the time, what most concerned me was that I had two people in a police car that was loaded with special weapons, grenades, thousands of rounds of ammunition, and the potential for terrible things to happen more than what had already happened to me. It just tripled, even though they probably didn't know that there were a lot of extra weapons in my car, they could use my car itself as a weapon against me and the civilians. It happens so fast that you're hoping everything you've ever been trained and all your instincts and everything will kick in and you don't actually think about what it is you, what you're doing. I think you just react. J.T. O'Daniel, also a SWAT team member, spent six days in the hospital and two months at home recuperating. He's now a master trooper working Warwick County.